Hiren Hirin Ved is joining us now, Director and Chief Investment Officer, Alchemy Capital Management. Hiren, good morning. Great to have you with us here on the program. Thanks very much. Uh, Hiren, uh, let's just st start by talking about the PSU call from here. You know, our colleague Hormuz was summarizing what, uh, you know, the folks at Kotak are saying. Uh, you know, they're picking out uh, some of these stocks and saying, well, valuations are just absurd now in many pockets. Uh, you know, it's uh, obviously one can't make a sweeping generalization, uh, but uh, what are the pockets you like and what are the pockets you'd avoid there? So I think, I mean, you know, PSUs in general have been the leaders of, of this bull market, right? I mean, and uh, obviously one has to be pretty selective, but I think uh, the, the, the starting point was two. One is that uh, the valuations relative to everything else in the market were cheap uh, to give to begin with. And secondly, the largest strategic shareholder, which is the government of India, right? I mean, they have taken several steps across businesses to increase the value of the PSUs. And while I haven't read the entire report, but I think I did see a headline which says that it's all top down. But it has to be top down because, you know, if the largest stakeholder uh, takes all the right, broadly all the right calls, then I think what happens initially is that you get a valuation re-rating and then earnings also kick in, right? Again, I, as you rightly mentioned, I'm not making a case for an unbridled across the board rally in all PSUs like we have seen. But I think there is merit in a few select PSUs where I do think that the trajectory of business has substantially changed, uh, especially if you look at the defense pack uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the kind of order books that have come or in some of the uh, power utilities where suddenly power has become a growth sector from a utility sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. By the way, one space that's really surging, and I think um, Prashant also mentioned it, is the real estate space. Macrotech developers is now at a fresh high, fresh 52-week high, that is. 7.5% rally. It's rallied 23% this year already. Hiren, hi, good morning. Uh, you know, there's a lot happening, right? There is uh, This weekend, actually, I, I had a chance to uh, go on the new um, uh, Trans Harbor Link, the Atal Setu, for the first time. And it is massive, the kind of infrastructure connectivity that we're seeing in Bombay, uh, in Mumbai, over the last uh, many weeks and months. But do you think a lot of this is already priced into the Mumbai-based developers? And do you think it's a little risky now to get in? Because uh, valuations also are looking a bit uncomfortable. Your thoughts on the real estate space, specifically the Mumbai-based guys. Now you have prestige also that's entered this space. So, Sonia, I think uh, overall, uh, you know, real estate as a sector is likely to do very, very well. Uh, Mumbai also, by the way, is one of the largest markets and one of the largest premium markets for real estate uh, uh, in India, along with uh, NCR and, and, and Bangalore. But I think uh, Bombay and 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 Delhi uh, in 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 that way stand out because the propensity to buy premium real estate is unparalleled in these two cities, right? I think I wouldn't, uh, you know, I mean, again, one has to be selective, but I think the real estate sector has a long, long way to go. In my view, uh, you know, there will be intermittent uh, bouts of correction and consolidation, but we continue to be very, very bullish on, on, on. If you're asking me, Mumbai real estate, I think uh, real estate in general, we are very positive. Uh, but I think even Mumbai real estate will continue to do quite well, even from okay. here. Okay. Okay, Mumbai real estate. All right. Uh, hi, Ren. Good to see you. In, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, What's your view with regard to this entire aviation space? You know, we had a large trade that took place on Interglobe Aviation a few minutes ago. More than 5% equity changes hands. The stock was down 4.5%. The kind of appetite we're seeing, stocks moved into the green. So, you know, we know about the rising airfares, leisure travel as well. How would you approach this space? You know, there are only two options. One is SpiceJet, which has been a big drag, but now they've got some funding. They're trying to turn things around. And there's Interglobe Aviation, which has been the leader of the pack. So, Nigel, frankly, we haven't looked at aviation, uh, uh, you know, as an investment opportunity. Obviously, the choices are very limited. In fact, 
at this point in time, there's only one carrier that you can really bet on. Uh, but I think it, it, you know, it's it's very symptomatic of the of the point that tourism as a whole is booming in this country, right? And I think there are several ways to play it. Uh, you know, one is to play it through the hotel and the hospitality sector, uh, but obviously, uh, uh, you know, airlines is another way to play it. And at this point in time, uh, you know, there is really very little choice other than Indigo. Uh, we find it very difficult, uh, uh, you know, because, uh, and, you know, again, airlines have done phenomenally well, uh, but we've we've tried to play this theme more through hotels rather than through uh, aviation. Okay. And what would the pick be out there? Well, all the, all the hotel chains seem to be good, but I think our exposure is to Indian hotels. Hmm. Okay, the exposure is to Indian hotels. The other stock that we have to look at this morning is Trend. Just look at the way it's zooming. A fresh high on Trend this morning. 6% higher if we can just pull up that stock. And you know, it's had a dream run. I mean, this year Trend is up almost about, what, 40%? Uh, if we can just look at this, just look at the way it's booming now. In the six months, it's doubled the stock. You know, um, this is a, a success story in affordable fashion, right? I mean, if you look at what Zudio has done in the last six months, Irene, it's given stiff competition to almost all regional retailers, whether it's Vmart, whether it's Style Bazaar, uh, V2 Retail, whatever, you right? And it's, it's also come into its own in terms of an affordable, fashion-strong brand. But um, from a stock market angle, from a retail investor's perspective, do you think one has missed the bus on this one or do you think that it's a long-term structural story? I think organized retailing in India is still very, very young. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there is significant opportunity for growth. Obviously, Trent has literally out-executed everybody in this space. And the market's rewarding Trent for that. Um, but I think that the runway for Zudio and other formats is still significantly large, given the size and scale of our country. Uh, very few, uh, you know, apparel retailers have really hit it big in that sweet value spot, right? I mean, the low ticket consumption in India has been struggling, but I think the value fashion segment that Trent has executed via the Zudio format I think has been extremely successful. And, uh, you know, one should not forget, but, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, the kind of focus, retailing is an extremely focus-oriented business, right? Margins are very thin and execution has to be top class. And I think it's a, in a very difficult industry trend clearly stands out. And unfortunately, there aren't too many uh, companies in this sector which have executed the way Trent is executed. So, I mean, I can't advise your retail investors, but all I can say uh, is that the runway for growth is still significantly long for a company like Trent. Okay, the runway for growth is significantly long. Just wanted to point out a couple of uh, more stocks. Uh, before we move on, Blue Star, by the way, is at a fresh 52-week high as well. It's been a very strong mover this year. Blue Star is up 40%. And there are a couple of new launches as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. By the way, I want to also talk about gold, right? I mean, eight straight trading sessions, gold has been hitting record highs. And the gold ETFs are performing very well, whether it's the Axis Gold ETF, the Bidla Sun Life Gold ETF, all of that performing very well. Hiren, just before we let you go, uh, a lot of the other asset classes are also coming back in a big way. While equities is sort of moving to the, you know, to the sidelines, you have gold that's hitting fresh highs, you have Bitcoin, I mean, cryptocurrencies are coming back in a big way, real estate is doing well. What should the best asset allocation strategy be for the rest of the year? Sonia, my asset allocation is all equities, but um, I think this is one of those rare uh, uh, phases that we are seeing, the sort of Goldilocks kind of scenario where all asset classes are, uh, uh, you know, are going up. Uh, it also, to some extent, reflects the risk on globally. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, again, I'm not an expert on, on other asset classes, but 
uh, I think people should diversify across asset classes. Uh, having said that, I think from an equities perspective, uh, you know, we wouldn't have asked for a better setting where earnings are strong, liquidity is still reasonably good, and uh, and I think we are seeing a structural move uh, in equities, and I think we are at least the price action in most other asset classes also looks like to be quite secular from here onwards. Okay, all right, we'll leave it at that, Hiren. Uh, have a great week. Thanks a lot for joining in. And since we were mentioning Blue Star a while back, hitting a fresh 52-week high, let's talk about that company.